I'm Josh Giddy and I'm down to dunk. Hey, this is Kenny Hustle and I'm down to dunk. I'm Darius Baisley and I'm down to dunk. I'm Mike Muscala and I'm down to dunk. This is Kapoku and I'm down to dunk. I love cereal. Captain Crunch. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Cracklin' Oat Brand. Oh, I can have these. I'm going to share with my team, but I'm a hog most of Welcome to Down to Dunk. I'm your host, Andrew Schleck. We're part of the Athletic Podcast Network. With me, as always, on Wednesdays, Alex, Alex what's up? What's up, Andrew? Just when you thought that the Thunder offseason couldn't get any better, we get Chet, and now we get Chip. Wow. We have Chit and Chip. Chet and Chip? All in careful. Got to be careful. Uh, uh, that- that's pretty what, exciting, isn't it? Where were you when you found out that Chip England from the Spurs, the legendary shooting coach, was coming to the Thunder? Where were you? Uh, I was just preparing for the show uh, on, it, all, all by my lonesome um, wow. in, this, in these early morning hours. It's, <laughs> it's just so awesome because for literally the entire run of the Thunder, shooting has been something we've talked about probably every single podcast. Like, yeah. oh, if this guy can just develop a shot, or oh, if he could just shoot 33% from three, yep. you know, how many guys have there been on the Thunder where if they could just shoot 33%, our, our bar had gotten so low, Painful. you know, and the idea of hiring a shooting coach or stealing away a shooting coach has always been like one of those just like dumb fan ideas, like <laughs> where you, you say it because it like sounds so obvious, but oh, you know, there must be so some smart. reason yeah. why this doesn't actually happen, right? you know? And so for that like fan fever dream to actually come true and we get one of the two shooting coaches that any like regular NBA fan would possibly know mm-hmm. that feels huge. Is he the most famous shooting coach in the world? Uh probably I mean Fred Vinson obviously is is getting he's getting is coming up. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> is how old is Fred Vinson? I I think of him as like a a uh, young man, he might be. Yo, know, he's fifty-one. Okay, yeah. he's fifty-one. Chip is sixty-one. Um, now, was Chip? Chip isn't Dirk's guy, though, right? Gosh, I don't. I didn't think so. Um, because that guy was famous too. Who? Who was? Oh, that was a uh, Holger Gershwin winner. Holger yeah. Ge- Holger Geschwinder. On the tip of my tongue, uh, Chip's real name. And I misspelled his name in on the YouTube. It's there's two L's. Ingle Land. England. Yeah. Uh Arthur Edward Chip, England the third. Um Arthur Edward? Mm-hmm. England, Chip the third. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh I po- I posted a if you want to learn more about him, I posted an article from 2014 from Grantland, written by Bill Barnwell, which is kind of interesting. Oh wow, I haven't heard you, that. You might know about Bill Barnwell. He's the ESPN NFL smart guy. Yeah, but he wrote an article about Chip back in 2014, and if you just like go over throughout Spurs history, like there's so many names that either are directly their their improvement is directly attributed to Chip, or you could imagine that it would be attributed to Chip. Like mm-hmm. direct names, it's like Kawhi, Tony Parker, Dejounte Murray, Marco yeah, Bellinelli, Gary Neal. Like there are so many guys throughout Spurs history, both stars and role players who have had either their best shooting seasons in San Antonio or developed their shot and then would go on to somewhere else and, and continue to be really good shooters. Mm-hmm. So this isn't like just about Josh Giddy. It's not just about Chet. Like I really feel like you can look at the entire roster and start imagining things in your head. It's not going to work out for everyone. Okay. Yeah. We, we know that not, it's, I, I'm not like baking in 40% shooting across the board. <laughs> for every single player, you can look at the Spurs last few years. Hmm. They've shot like 35% as a team. So it's not like yeah. a guarantee, but you've also seen what guys we like given. what we would have given just to shoot 35%. Yeah. But you look at guys even like Keldon Johnson, yeah. who all of a sudden is shooting like 44% or whatever from three on five attempts. Like somebody's going to pop 
mm-hmm. on this Thunder roster as a result of bringing in Chip England. And obviously we hope that it's guys like Josh Giddy and, and that Chet can become like an insane shooter. But there's probably gonna it's probably gonna help other guys too. Like, what, Lou Dort, Lou Dort, Andrew, what Dort. about Lou Dort? This is this was the this is the reason they felt comfortable giving Dort his contract it was because they knew Chip was coming down the pipeline. And I think what's interesting is so he we didn't necessarily steal we OKC we. didn't necessarily yes. steal Chip England away because he yeah. had already decided this news had already come out that he wasn't going to return to the Spurs right and a lot of the conversation around that was oh, he just doesn't want to be a part of a rebuilding team because he's been in San Antonio this entire time when they've been trying to win. Like, what other possible reason could there be? Mm-hmm. Obviously, that's not the case. He's going to Oklahoma City. But then the there are two seasons ahead of where the Spurs are, though, too, which probably matters. For sure. But, like, if he really wanted to go to a, like, com- competitive, like a team that's going to be a contender no like doubt. next year, like, there are other options. Yeah. Then there was there was a thing that they just reached like a contract, like uh, a negotiation impasse where they He'll just me, couldn't yeah. settle on something. So maybe that's it. Maybe we just paid him more. He knows Sam Presti back from the San Antonio days. Yep. But it does feel like a coup. Feels like a coup, Andrew. I like to believe that the sequence of events went like this. The Thunder pumped for Josh Giddy in summer league. He plays well, but they see his shooting form and see the way he's shooting the three ball, and they say, get Chip England on the phone. We've got to fix this. Yeah, uh, It's not true. That's just my it fan. And if there was like a graphic novel written about the Chip England hiring, I think that it would uh, include that. I mean, I, I, this is so exciting. I mean, let's just name off the guys on the team yeah. who your opinion of would dramatically increase if they suddenly became just a decent shooter. Yeah. Just a decent shooter. We're talking Lou Dort. If he, if yeah. he became like a 38% three-point shooter overall, it would, it would be incredible. It, it would make his contract look silly. Stupid. It looks stupid. It's so cheap. It's so cheap. <laughs> we would have uh, we we burned him again. Uh, Usman Jang, that's a huge one for me. That's a huge one. It's a huge one. We're going to talk about 2007 here in a little bit. He, I, I forget like how much like easy on the on vibes he has, but if he could like really shoot it, it would make a big difference. Uh, Chet Holmgren, obviously, like we're excited about Chet shooting. It, if but... he just takes Chet, because baseline, I think Chet's a good shooter and is going to be a good shooter. Right. But if he can make him a great shooter, like that's that's the difference between Chet being like a really solid player and being like a great player. Um, Jalen Williams. We actually feel pretty J dub feel pretty good about him. Aaron Wiggins. I mean, you yeah. saw a promise already in summer league. Maybe he's, he gives, maybe he's wanting to show chip a little something before he got here, you know, like start, start with me. Yeah. You can wrap up with me really quick. I'm really close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cause like, legitimately i'm going to keep going through but legitimately this will change some of these guys careers most yeah. likely yeah yeah uh jeremiah robinson earl it just yes. hits one or three baby like that's... darius darius baisley uh, maybe maybe uh, andrew use your resources elsewhere chipper uh josh giddy obviously josh giddy is the one right he's the one where you're yeah. where you're like hey chip meet josh you are now roommates you know um, that I think will, they'll make him live with them. Interesting. It's possible. You know, some people like living with their grandparents. The, uh, That's true. Live-in shooting coach. Yeah. I Man, Josh is the one, though, right? Because all these other guys like have a baseline. Even Dort's got like a baseline where you're like, you know what? Like, he's not like the worst shooter ever. Um, yeah. Josh is the one where you're like, oh, man, if he could ever figure it out, like this is an all-star player. And without this piece in place, it's hard. It's hard to even like imagine. Like, okay, could he even become just like a guy that hits thirty-two percent from three? You know, now with Chip here, with like what he did with a player like Kawhi, who went late in the draft because he couldn't shoot. Yeah, and then taught him to shoot. And Kawhi obviously is like good off the dribble, but like his standstill three is not like a quick release. But if you just had to worry about him, if you just had to close out on Josh Giddy, it will make 
such a big difference. Um, Josh is the one. If if things work out in some way, that it could change this era. I mean, Tony Parker and Kawhi just being able to shoot changed everything for the Spurs. Yeah. And then the last name I'll throw out there. I haven't included Shea and uh, Trey Mann, but, you know, that yeah. obviously could always improve. But the last name I'll include, uh, Poku. Maybe. Poku. He could change Poku's life. He could change Poku's life. Honestly, that is the piece with Poku where when he shoots, you just like, yeah, that's not going in. Just it's it's flat. It's not going in. If he really could teach Poku to shoot, he could unlock – the greatest player of all time so no, no pressure <laughs> yeah. but but we just went through the roster and uh probably named like 85 percent of the players who might play this year like there there is there is room for chip england he will yeah. have his hands full with yeah. this roster yeah yeah it's it's a big deal just to have a guy that you trust to fix somebody's shot because i do think josh needs it fixed um i think dort if dort could shoot it well at least from the corners and same with jerry like if it's really just those three and he can help improve other guys here and there like that's a it's a huge deal um yeah i mean you you take away the shooting of the spurs and the guys that chip directly affected they don't win very many titles you know shooting is so important and this is the the second worst shooting team in the league last year and they're rebuilding it didn't matter and they're rebuilding again this year if it takes time for these guys to reform their shots it's fine uh, but in the next like three or four years like, you've got to be able to shoot the basketball now the you big know. question andrew uh has this changed your opinion on their over under for this year no i think i think it takes time to uh ref- i don't think that chip just gets here and like you get to move the sliders on the 2k ratings for these guys mm, i think you might be time. able to <laughs> that, in that bill barnwell story he talks about how when he first met with Kawhi, it was 72 hours before the lockout yeah so he basically had 72 hours to impart any wisdom he could onto Kawhi leonard and he told him like a couple things like changed where the ball came out yeah. And then had to just send Kawhi away to work on, out on his own. And when he came back, he was already shooting better. That's a legendary story. Well, we're, we're about to have so many of those. Maybe that's all he needs to do. Just get on the phone with Josh. Just, right tell now. Him, just, give, him, just give him one little thing. One little tip. He gives him two, t- two tips on how to shoot a basketball. And it changes everything. I'd love to know what, what it was. You know, like what, what was it? that flipped Kawhi's shooting you know like that is uh, do you want me to tell you that is wild is it is it mentioned in the story uh yeah he said that um <laughs> Jeremy Morton uh, in the chat says that Kawhi shot 38 percent through his rookie year after shooting 29 percent in college the year before so it says first they altered Leonard's release point shifting it from a spot over Leonard's head to one in front of his face they drilled a new shot for a couple days before the lockout hit, at which point Leonard was stuck familiarizing himself with his new mechanics by himself in Las Vegas and San Diego. That's all I said. Hmm. And that okay. was good enough. Wow. But yeah, I, I uh, obviously going into summer league, we were hoping like, ooh, Josh has had some months off. Let's see what the new shot looks like. Unleash the shot, Giddy. Release the Giddy cut. And uh, it, it didn't really happen. <laughs> So I, I'm hoping for, like, honestly, a little dramatic change with yeah. Josh. Some of these other guys, their shots are just like whatever. You, you don't, like, they don't stand out in a negative way. It's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, if that went in, <laughs> it would look like a good shot. Like mm-hmm. Usman Jang. <laughs> like, his shot is, like, looks good enough. Yeah. He's whereas, still, like, Josh is his a little reminiscent. His a little reminiscent of Kawhi that's, like, over here. It's more like a catapult with Us. Oh, you're, you're saying Usman's the next Kawhi? I mean, we're talking the 11th pick in the draft. Drafted in the sweet Which spot. Is, is the sweet spot. Okay. That's not... Where was Kawhi was drafted 15th, He's right? 15. Yeah. Okay. But but pretty close. Rumors that Us might go 15th. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> but seriously, that's this seems like a guy that could like if if Usman Jang shot it thir- if shot thirty eight percent from three, like how much better would you feel about him as a player? It, it's I feel like we're gonna have all the same conversations we always have had. We're just bumping up the percentages by like three points instead of saying yeah, if he can just shoot thirty five percent. We have to do it. We had to bump him up. He's <laughs> yeah. Great Pape says Uzi is Paul George. That's pretty okay. sim- pretty simple, man. Yeah. So. Okay, real quick before we move on, I think I think we all agree on the number one. But if you could go back in Thunder history mm-hmm. and link up Thunder players with Chip England, mm-hmm. who 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 would be your like top three? Russell Westbrook, number one. Oh, okay. Is that not Russ- what you were thinking? Well, honestly, I was thinking of Robertson, oh. just because he was the guy we were always like, if if he just like went in the gym. For the summer and only shot threes for seven hours a day. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's not practicing. <laughs> Andre was such a, uh, it was so much in his head, too. You yeah. Know? Where um, Russ was never in his head. Russ always was going to shoot the ball no matter what. And if you fixed Westbrook's shot, I mean, he was the MVP one year because he shot the ball well. You know, people forget, like, oh, it's just about the triple doubles. Like, no, Russ shot the ball well that year. If Russ shoots the ball well, he's a top five player in the NBA. Yeah, for sure. Because he's definitely taking them. He's going to take them. No issues there. Is he going to make them? No, he's not. No. But he is going to take them. Um, I'm going I'm going through all of the uh, rosters. Are people are people shouting out any names? Um, uh, Francis McCarthy, who I met in Vegas. Uh, great dude. It says Perry Jones the third. Perry Jones the third. We're getting into some deep cuts. Deep cut already. Uh, we got I don't know Rocks if that was. And then uh, Rogthor says Serge Ibaka. Yeah, Ibaka might have been. I mean, it, that was just such a different time. I feel like his thing was as much about volume as it was about accuracy. Yeah, for sure. Yanni says Terrence Ferguson. Yeah, Ferg. There's a guy who had a shot that looked like a shot, yeah, but it just didn't work out a lot of times. Yeah. Oh, Hustis, huh? I'd like Josh Hustis to still be in the NBA. Chip England could have saved his career. Yeah, there's so many guys in like, I mean, if they just had so like this, the year they went to the finals, they let's see, guys that played. I mean, Sabonis is a really interesting one because they wanted him to take threes his rookie season. Yeah. And he's just now preparing to take threes in an NBA season again. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, Serge is a big one because by 2016, he was still on the team. He shot 32% from three. Mm. If he was shooting like 36% from three, that would have been yeah. a big deal. What about the uh, fully unleashed Deion Waiters? Mm. Not for me. <laughs> it's definitely for me. <laughs> That's for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it is certainly an interesting hire and a, and a big deal because this guy has a history of fixing player shots. Um, Chip England was the ball boy for John Wooden. Wow. UCLA Bruins 1975 championship team. Isn't that wild? There's actually a lot of interesting that's stuff with him. Insane. Like that's unbel- that's an unbelievable thing about him. He um cuz the team he played for I, I I don't know if it was high school or like junior college, but uh Steve Kerr was like the next in line after him. Yeah. Like w- when he was actually a basketball player. And then he became like really famous in the Philippines. He went and played overseas and was like incredible in the Philippines. Mhm. Yeah, that's oh. he's known as the machine gun for oh, his interesting. shooting skills. Yeah, that's pretty wild. He has two sons named Press and Path. Press and Path? Yeah. Wow. I don't, that's that is he's a he's a honestly he's a pioneer in the game of basketball and in naming children. Press and Path. Yeah, that's that's kind of hard to say. It is kind of yeah. Press England, Pat, 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 
Path England. Path England. Path England. Pioneer. Interesting. I'm glad to have him here. Hopefully, Pioneer. Uh, hopefully, uh, press and path join uh, join us here in OKC as well. Hope to see them at a game. Uh, okay, we're gonna take a quick <laughs> when we come back. We are going to talk about a new uh, segment that we're gonna have over the next uh, how, how many weeks, Al? Five or six weeks. Yeah, as many as we can get. As many as we can get. We're trying to milk the content here. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Sam Presti, for hiring Chip to give us a little 20-minute morsel of content. But we will be right back after this quick break. And we're back after that quick break. Um, we got to fill content, guys. We got to do it. And this is because not only is it the off season, but this is our first long off season mm -hmm. in like three years. And I'm feeling it. Yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. I, I'm I, I'm glad we get a little bit of a break. But content wise, we need to we need to fill it up because we're not stopping. Other podcasts are like, you know what? We're gonna stop. We're gonna go to you know, half as many shows. We're like, you no. talking about Saturday Slam and Jam, our other show? Yes, I'm talking about the <laughs> other shows that I do, which I'm very thankful that we're doing less. <laughs> <laughs> these other podcasts out these there these other podcast jokers including like the 15 that i produce <laughs> are going to half as many um we're not we're gonna keep going and we're so we're gonna start with the 2007 draft free agency and we're gonna grade the thunder off seasons from 2007 up until today so. Yeah, uh, if you if you haven't uh, heard, if you, if you haven't been on Twitter, I was on a uh, you know ball with Trillbro dude, and it's, we did it's a worth uh, your time. By the way, it's a really fun listen. We did a two hour podcast about the 2019 off season, just reliving it, and it was it was so much fun. I was like, why we should just do this for the Thunder? We'll just go year by year, um, just to kind of you know, especially I, there's probably some new fans out there yeah. who maybe weren't around at the beginning trying to go back and learn some uh, OKC Thunder history. So we're going to go through, obviously, Andrew mentioned trades and drafts. Don't don't forget free agents, Andrew. There will eventually be free agents somewhere I have in here. I have First couple of years, NA, but yeah, we'll get there. And uh, we're going to go through all these and then give Sam Presti a grade based on what we know now. Yeah. Based on what we know now. Now, this is a good week uh, to do these first couple. We're going to try to do four a week. We'll see how it goes. Because I, I think the grading will be pretty easy, these first three, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Legendary players three years in a row. It's pretty <laughs> pretty simple. But we're, we're going to be tough graders, Andrew. I'm not just giving away A pluses okay. every year. Yeah, I mean, maybe these first three, okay. But after then, <laughs> I'm going to get pretty strict. Um, okay, so you ready to travel back? The Summers of Presti. Let's do it. So Sam Presti was uh, 30 years old. Summers of Sam is what we're calling our Oh, series. Summers of Sam. God, how did that? Sometimes there's such an obvious name. Yep. And I forget it. Summer. That, that is also a reference to a, uh, a serial killer, correct? It is. But uh, he's, a, he's a killer as a GM. And also that was one summer. Summer of Sam. This is plural. Yeah. Summers of Sam. Yeah. Okay. So the first, uh, first year is 2007. This is of course also, we know a guy named Sam Summers. That's true. We did know a guy named Sam Summers. Yeah. I mean, I guess I still know him. I don't. I I haven't yeah. seen him in a long time. Yeah. Maybe he's a listener. Yeah, maybe. Hi, Sam. <laughs> uh, let's start off with 2007, as I mentioned. But let's start off with the big trade, the first big trade of Sam Presti's GM career. So I do I do want to mention one thing before we start. We're doing a lot of preamble. What? This is important. Sam Presti. This was. The, the summer that Sam Presti was hired to run the Sonics. Right. And he was hired after the draft lottery. After they had jumped up to two. Yes. So he... From like 11 or something. Something crazy. He didn't even have like, the, the, the joy of, of that lottery night. Like he just... He was hired after that, which I thought... Which I think is an interesting note in like the um, Chronicle. So that first trade, Ray Allen... 2007 second rounder, which it turned in Glenn Davis, yeah. to Boston for the number five pick in the 20, 2007 draft, Wally Zerbiak, Delonte West, and a 2008 second round pick. First of all, I want to read you this Presti quote about that trade right after it. Just such a Presti quote. 
To make the decision to move a player and a person like Ray Allen was tremendously difficult. Boston really pursued this. What started as a smaller conversation became fulfilled. Their pursuit was impeccable. <laughs> that, that was uh, Sam Presley talking about the deal with the Celtics. Now, interestingly, this deal almost didn't happen. In fact, Presti called Danny Ainge on the day of the draft to tell him that he would be willing to trade Ray Allen. Do you know who Danny Ainge would have taken if he had been forced to use the pick? Oh, I found God. this on an old Sports Illustrated article. Who do you think Danny Ainge would have taken? Hmm. This would have been at five. This would have been um, at five. Gosh. Corey Brewer? I don't know. Danny Ainge had targeted Chinese forward Yi Jean Leon, whom okay. Ainge rated as the player with the most upside in this draft. It's still, it's, it's probably true. Okay. You think it's still true? I think it's still <laughs> true. In 2022, you think it's still true that Yi Jong Leon has the most upside in the 2007 draft? Okay. It's not a very good draft. <laughs> um, so on the morning of the draft, when Presti calls Ainge, he says he's willing to trade Allen, but he wants the number five pick and Rajon Rondo. Wow. Isn't that interesting? And yeah. Ainge refuses to throw in Rondo. They yeah. hang up. Then Presti calls back, says, fine, I'm willing to do it for Delonte West and Wally Zerbiak. Yeah. When really he just wanted... The number five. I mean, obviously, that'd be awesome if you could get Rajon Rondo yeah. at the time. Something I forgot, though, the reaction to this trade. Because we didn't know at this time that Kevin Garnett was coming. In fact, they had been trying to trade for Kevin Garnett. And the number five pick was going to be a part of whatever package that yeah. was going to be. Yep, I remember And so that. when they trade the number five pick, a lot of people assume, okay, the KG deal's off. What is this team with, like... Paul Pierce and Ray Allen. NBA draft.net, Andrew. Boston draft grade F. F, Andrew. Listen to this. The Celtics are quickly becoming the laughing stock of the NBA. Danny Ainge should have been fired long ago, and this team should be run by a GM with the job security to build for the future. Just as he did a year ago, Ainge traded away a top seven pick, which could have been another building block for the future. Yeah. When a GM is in position where they make moves to save their job so they can win now, they should be fired before going any further. And you Isn't know, interesting? yeah, if you think about it too, like the Garnett stuff could have gone in a lot of different directions. Because I remember like the Phoenix Suns were in the running for for KG as well. And like if Phoenix would have just pulled the trigger on a KG yeah. deal, like then like what do the Celtics do? You know, if they're stuck with like this Paul Pierce Ray Allen team, that's like a good team, but a team that's like stuck in the middle. Like, were they like the seventh best team in the East or something like that? Right. You know, it's it all came together for them and they won a title. And, you know, it's, you know, Danny got to stay for forever and then basically got to choose to do this, like, do a job in Utah where he's from. Um, but yeah, things. A lot of these things are on the razor's edge and you don't even like think about it, you know, and same for like Sam Presti and like Sam's legacy you know, If Sam ends up. If if the Blazers are convinced, if, if the Blazers are reading uh, Ben Gulliver at the time on Blazers edge and they're like, you know what, this guy's right. We got to take Kevin Durant and they take Kevin Durant. Then like, what does Sam do it to? Like, I think you have to take Greg Oden. Oh, yeah. And, like, yeah. a lot of GMs were surveyed at the time saying that they would have taken Greg. Like, that would have been the guy. Greg. I've never just called him Greg until just then. I think I've always called him Greg Oden. I just called him Greg. He just doesn't. Yeah, and honestly, when you said Greg, I was thinking of Greg Brown. Remember that guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gre yeah it's just feel he doesn't feel like a Greg, but I guess he is a Greg. Um, I think they would have taken Oden. You know, and then like, what does, what do the Thunder look like? Like, it's just, it's just like this, it's just this one pick, you know, it changes everything. And that, I think, and we're going to see that play out too with this current team, you know, that has Shea and Giddy and Chet and we'll get 10 years down the road and be like, oh my gosh, like if they would have just, if maybe if they would have taken this guy or if holy smokes if if the magic take chet then like we don't have this amazing run or whatever like we just don't know what it looks like yet but you know at the time 
you didn't know like how close you were to the team just not even having an amazing start like they did right and uh another example i wanted to read you this is from uh bill simmons draft diary there's gonna be a lot of Bill Simmons today because there just weren't a lot of people uh, writing about the NBA draft at this well, time. Bill like shaped my NBA fandom in so many ways. You know, uh, he absolutely did. Okay, so this was when uh, the trade was made. He said, "Thanks to rumors that the Celtics might trade the number five pick for soon to be 32 year old shooting guard coming off double ankle surgeries." I just spent the last 20 minutes on basketball reference trying to find one great shooting guard who didn't decline significantly in years 12 through 14 of his NBA career. Here's the list. Reggie Miller. That's it. Also, I just threw up in my mouth and some of it went back up in my nose. Like Celtics. I've, it's so weird going back now because obviously it was a great move in retrospect. It brought them a championship. Yeah. But at the time, like Ray Allen was a very good player, but if you were trading for someone like that, he needs to be what he ended up being for the Celtics, which was like their third guy. Yeah. And at that point, he was their second guy. Right. And so people were understandably uh, upset. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a massive deal. And it turns out like there were really four guys in this draft that mattered. <laughs> you know, I guess, I mean, there's others that are further down on the list, but like of the guys who went in like the top seven, you know, it's... Conley, Horford, KD, and and Greg, you know, that really mattered, I guess. And obviously Odin was, you know, riddled with injuries, but, you know, the Kevin Durant, Horford, Conley were the guys. And, like, Jeff Green was just, like, the ultimate tease, really, until he got toward the end of his career and was just, like, a role player. But, you know, how many teams did he tease up until then? Like, Memphis, the Celtics. Boston, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was – that was that was his role in the NBA was to make people think he was great, and then he just there were just nights that he didn't show up. One thing I thought was really interesting, completely forgot this. So I was reading the mock draft between Chad Ford and Bill Simmons, uh-huh. and th- and they were debating KD versus Odin. And Chad Ford said this. He said, "Here's the analogy I use: taking Kevin Durant is like dating a supermodel. She's hot." Everyone thinks you're cool for being next to her. For a few years, everything is great, but when it's time to settle down, have kids start a life, she's eyeing younger guys, partying late at night, leaving you in the dust the next time a good thing comes along. Wow. Isn't that because my perception of like the early KD years is completely the opposite. He was built up as like the next Tim Duncan by the media, which I think we eventually learned like wasn't exactly KD's personality. Yeah. But that's interesting. I thought that Chad, and, and in comparison, he was said taking Odin is like marrying the girl you don't want to date, but the girl you want to spend the rest of your life with. <laughs> they were talking this like idea of loyalty was like the big differentiating point. Like there were no uh, like concerns about Odin wanting to leave in the future if he was drafted by a team, whereas they were talking about KD already eyeing big markets, which yeah. I had just completely forgotten about that. Yeah, and at and at this time too, you know, this is still the Seattle Supersonics taking Durant. Right. Um, and I listened to I was power washing my house this morning and listening to the redraftables with Rosillo and, and Simmons on the two thousand seven draft. Oh yeah. And he talks so much about how he's he said the number two pick was like it was such a tragedy throughout NBA history. You like to talk about Sam Bowie and all these guys. Right. He was like, well, Durant like fixed it, but he honestly he didn't fix it because he still ended up having to leave Seattle. And that really just makes this pick really tragic. <laughs> um it's just like, man, like he was still talking about I think they did this podcast like two or three years ago. Um and he's like still talking about like the tragedy of Seattle, you know. And I get it. I, I totally get what he's saying, but still, like to not mention that like things have gone like pretty well in Oklahoma City is kind of silly to me. So the last thing I have for this is just the <laughs> some draft grades. Yeah. NBA draft.net gave it an A plus. Yeah. Said 30 year old Sam Presti is off to a great start. They said pairing Durant with Green was a masterful move, as the skills of the two will mesh like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> 
Uh, Green is the consummate team player who does everything besides score. Not that he can't. And Durant figures to be one of the top scores in the NBA game in time. Yeah. On the flip side, Andrew, Draft Express, Jonathan Gavoni gave the draft a C. Really? Yes. Uh, what did he say? He said, well, he, he didn't like the... He said, Sam Presti and Co. Began, began the prospect of restructuring their new roster with a bang, trading away an aging 26-point-per-game score for a future very solid role player in Jeff Green. This might have been the most value Seattle could have gotten from Allen. Uh Joe Kim Noah at number five probably would have made this trade make a little more sense. Don't disagree, but we really can't make a final judgment until we see what Presti ends up doing with Richard Lewis this summer. Right now, this roster has a lot of holes, <laughs> particularly at the shooting guard position. Oh no, PJ Carlismo's got that figured out. Don't worry about that, Jonathan. Uh, and then trading the 31st pick for a future second rounder in cash shows the kind of financial restrictions that Seattle is under. Something that has to be disappointing for Supersonics fans. So he mentioned two other trades in there the first one being richard lewis which they eventually did trade to orlando for a 2009 second round pick which was number 57 and a trade exception Mm -hmm. on its face not a great trade right now it was a sign-in trade so you're not expecting to get a lot back in a sign-in trade richard lewis was 27 at the time he had averaged 22 points per game which was a career high the season prior yeah the the other trade is that which I, I have no explanation for other than they were saving money. They traded the number 31 overall pick. So the first pick of the second round, which ended up being Carl Landry, yeah. traded him to Houston for cash and a later second in 2008, number 56. We haven't seen a trade like that from the Thunder since then. Yeah, That seems like a yeah. very unique one-off thing. Yeah, he's clearing the decks, you know, in preparation for 08 and 09, you know. Um, now the, the, the important part of that Richard Lewis though, is that they got a trade exception mm-hmm. and that trade exception would be used to absorb Kurt Thomas later that summer. They sent out a 2009 second round pick for Kurt Thomas, a 2008 first, which became Serge Ibaka and a 2010 first, which became the 26 pick, which would eventually be used for Cole Aldrich, which we'll talk about later. The part I forgot, I forgot that they flipped Kurt Thomas again at the deadline yep. for another first from San Antonio. So yeah. all this stuff that Sam Presti has been doing these last few years, it's he's been doing it the entire time from he the beginning. From, yeah, he did it from the beginning. And like most people know the story of like the Kurt Thomas deal, but one of the picks became a Baca. And that that's the team we have now is because of that trade. Like if they don't make that deal, they don't get Serge Ibaka. I mean, they flip Ibaka. We, we know like the line it goes, but it's like Ibaka for Peaky Baca. Peaky Baca. Peaky Baca value. They they flip Peaky Baca for Oladipo and Sabonis. You flip Oladipo and Sabonis for Paul George. You flip Paul George for SGA and all the picks. And like we're now just like starting to discover what that trade became, which I think now like the the tally is SGA, Trey Man, and J Dub, right? Is there anything yeah. else we've gotten so far? Um that sounds good. Yeah. And like we don't know what J Dub and Trey Man are gonna be yet, but like SGA for Trey Man and J Dub for Paul George, like that seems pretty good so far. And they haven't even gotten to like all the, the juicy picks yet. So um it's gonna be pretty interesting to see where that ends up. But like the birth of that was the this random Kurt Thomas trade that I think at the time very few people understood. Um no free agents signed that summer. You've got to which, be kidding which me. Which will be kind of a theme. Uh, okay, Andrew, final grade, unless you have anything else you want to talk about with the 2007 offseason. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go A. I'm going A+. Plus. You're you? allowed to use pluses and minuses. Okay, I would go I would go plus if they took... I think, and this is probably unfair, but if they would have taken Joe Kim Noah at five instead of Jeff Green... You know what, though? Like, if they do that, do they get both Westbrook and Harden? Probably not. I don't know. Like, Joachim Noah wasn't, didn't, like, bust out the gates as, like, this, some great player. He did not bust out the gates. I don't think so. By his third season, though, he was 10 and 11. Yeah, third season. That's where that's when we need him to bust out the gates. 
chill out for a minute and then be our center of the future. So you think they could have still been terrible? Because that was the that was the narrative early in the Thunder run was we didn't have a center. Mm -hmm. We were looking at guys, you know, like Nanad, of course, we brought in. How exciting was that? Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think the team would have made more sense earlier if Joe Kim Noah was there. Maybe so. Jeff Green was pretty good, though. Like, he wasn't a bad player. You know, um, he defended well. He scored in big spots. He, like, hit some game winners. Like, he's a, yeah, like, for sure. He's, he's not a bad player. That's why I'm not, it's not like you're just adding Noah out of nowhere. Like, you're displacing, yeah. like, Noah for Jeff Green. I, I just think of if if you could just and obviously when you, you change one player for another, like it changes the history of everything. So you can't really do that. But just think about Noah with those teams. And also you think about like okay, they have to reach for they reached for Westbrook at four. Maybe they could have gotten him a little bit later. And then you think about the um, the 09 draft and how good that draft was. Like, if you don't get hardened, there's still so many good players in that draft, you know, yeah. that, are, that are later. So, like, the alternate timeline of like Kevin Durant, Joe Kim Noah, Westbrook, plus whoever you get in that 09 draft, like, that is still like this alternate timeline to me where like that's probably the right pick. And I think obviously Noah didn't have like some long career, but. You could argue that like they probably win the title. <laughs> you have Joe Kim Noah at center, you know, they, instead of yeah. all the guys that they have, because he was, I mean, he was so so good. Wasn't he like fifth in MVP voting one year? Yeah, his peak. He was twelve point six points per game, eleven point three rebounds, five point four assists, yeah. one point two steals, one point five blocks. Man, he was a he was a fantasy star. He was. He was and, and really good and the exact kind of player because like you, the Thunder didn't need like some like twenty point score next to those guys. They needed somebody to do everything else, and Noah did everything else, including pass and block shots and you know handle the ball a little bit here and there. But and if we had gotten him, that would have completed the trifecta of Billy Donovan players because we've we've had Corey Brewer, had Al Horford, could have had Joachim Noah. That's true. Um, oh, okay, so Andrew gives uh, Sam an A. I give an A+. Plus. Hmm, interesting. All right, 2008. 2008, uh, you know, we'll start with, with the draft. This is, of course, the Russell Westbrook draft at number four. Yep. Then they took Serge Ibaka at number 24. DJ White they traded for at number 29. And then they took Devon Harden, the prelude to James Harden, at That's number right. 50. Um. What the, I have so many things to share with you. <laughs> I'm I'm just I'm debating what to share with you first. Let's start pre-draft. Okay. Okay. This is Chad Ford pre-draft. Rumors. This is all we had for rumors back then. Chad Ford was the only person who thought anyone would be interested in rumors. And we loved him for it. We did. Seattle GM Sam Presti is notoriously tough to read, but sources say it appears that Brooke Lopez, Russell Westbrook, and Eric Gordon are in the mix for the yeah. Sonics. Yeah, Seattle that. has been talking to other teams about moving down a few spots with an eye toward drafting one of those three. But with the Knicks' strong interest in Westbrook and Gordon at number six and the Clippers looking at Westbrook, Gordon, and Lopez at number seven, the Sonics could lose out on the guy they want. So they might just end up keeping their pick. I think Presti's heart is with Westbrook, but his head will tell him to take Lopez. Wow. With recent lottery picks, Robert Swift and Mohamed Sene looking like bust so far. The Sonics have a huge hole in the middle. The Sonics have discussed trading this pick to the Clippers and moving down to draft at number seven. But as of now, those discussions appear to be dead. Wow. Wow. A little, scutt a little scuttlebutt from 16 years ago. That is really, that's good stuff, though. I mean, that is really <laughs> good. Wow. You know, people this, I, I, for such a hard time. They give him such a hard time for, you know, retroactively changing his, his mock drafts. You know what? He had a moment of weakness. Everybody, everybody's got moments of weakness. Don't give Chad such a hard time because he was he was super good. He was one of the best back then. He was he was all we had, and it and he did a really good job. And there was there was just no one else to compare him to at that time. Yeah, like Draft Express was kind of in its infancy. That was kind of like a, a hipster website to be going to. Right. Exactly. 
Um, okay, Bill Simmons' reaction to the Sonics taking Russell Westbrook at number four. Anyway, the Sonics pull a minor shocker by taking Russell Westbrook. Loved his potential, loved him all season, but even I can't defend that one. Who would have thought last year at this time that Russell Westbrook would have been the fourth pick in this draft? Jay Billis asks, last year, what about last week? What about five minutes ago? How does Seattle pass on Kevin Love? Kevin Love was definitely seen as like the safer pick at that time. And, um, a, great, was, and a great player, too. And a great player. Yeah. So understandable why people would freak out a little bit. It took him a little while to get going, but once like he was unleashed, early Kevin Love was pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, he was unreal. Yeah, he was definitely seen as like the best guy from that UCLA team. Like our, that's a really good UCLA team. Um but yeah, it was it did feel like I mean everybody knew it was a reach that night. I remember I don't know if I called you or text you about it. Because we we wanted a guard, we wanted Jared Bayless in this draft. Hell yeah, hell yeah! I remember I was like on some like on a mission trip or something, and I remember calling you the night of the draft, just like I couldn't believe what had happened. You know, I can't believe they took Russell Westbrook. Like, what does this mean? And we, it's just so weird to think about it too. Like, to think about like the draft party that we had like a month ago to like the way that the draft was like back then like it just it is like so much more of an event now than it was oh yeah like it was just like okay this is gonna happen like we didn't i we didn't talk about the draft like we did like we do now at all where gosh like how many pod like there may be like two podcasts done about the draft back then you know, I mean the o- the only place I would go is uh, Daily Thunder like comment section. That was yeah. the, uh, in fact, I just I, I I learned that I created my Twitter account in August two thousand nine. So like I didn't even I wasn't even on Twitter at this point. Yeah, it was yeah, basically it was Simmons yeah. podcast and it was Daily Thunder comment section. And yeah. I can remember people from that comment section, like that's how that's how like much of a community it was. Like yeah. I recognized people's names and I knew their opinions. Uh-huh. That was like our early proto Twitter. Yeah. It was so wild. And I remember like, and you couldn't go like watch film on these guys back then. Like you couldn't like have the ideas for yourself. Like you had to wait for these mock drafts and stuff like that to come out. And then you just had to take the type of player that they were and say, I would like to have that type of player, you know? Yeah. And like Jared Bayless was a guy who was like, man, like why wouldn't you want that guy next to Kevin Durant? I mean, it, uh, no, I'm thinking of DJ Augustine. Um, okay, some some trade grades. Now we mentioned how last year, 2007, NBA Draft.net yeah. gave them like an A plus, and then Draft Express gave them a C. Well, Andrew, NBA Draft.net A minus. The team without a home had a solid draft, adding one potential star in the backcourt with Westbrook and some solid front court potential. GM Sam Presti did a solid job to resist the temptation to add Brook Lopez and take a player with considerably more upside at the fourth pick in Russell Westbrook. It's decisions like this that they find a GM, and Presti made an excellent one. Wow. wow. That is NBA great. That is, that is kind of – that's a wild, wildly great analysis. Now listen to this. Draft Express, grade C. Possibly more than any team in the league, Seattle's adventure on Thursday is one that cannot really be properly evaluated for at least two to three years. Russell Westbrook is a player that may or may not prove to be worthy of starting at either backcourt position in the NBA, and taking him fourth was definitely a surprise looking at some of the other players that were on the board here. Is Westbrook enough of a playmaker to be a starting point guard in time? And if not, is he big enough and a good enough ball handler, outside shooter, and all-around scorer to start at the two? He can surely defend well enough at either position, but considering that he might need a very particular type of lead guard alongside him, was he worthy of being drafted fourth overall? On first glance, the answer to that seems to be no, but Sam Presti might know something we don't. I thought that was really interesting. (laughs) That is. And then listen to this. At 24, there is no question that Serge Ibaka had the physical tools and all-around upside to warrant being selected this high. The question is, will he ever play in the NBA? Abaka currently has offers on the table that may not allow him the financial flexibility needed under the NBA's rookie scale to justify paying his buyout along with the money he'll be leaving on the table in Spain. His agents didn't want him getting drafted in the first round. Did Presti call their bluff 
or did he just blow a first round pick? Only time will tell. Only time will tell. Wow. That is wild. <laughs> Bleacher Report. Their grade gave, gave Sam Presti an A. The Sonics GM Sam Presti is surrounding Kevin Durant with some great defenders. Russell Westbrook is one of the most athletic players in the draft. Just ask Cal or Oregon. He won Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year, and it should translate into good defense in the league. It will take him a year or two to learn the point guard position, but he will be solid. He has a chance to be a Gilbert Arenas type with less scoring. Less scoring, yes. <laughs> uh, won the scoring title, by the way. Uh, Ibaka from the Congo is only 18, and when he finally makes it to Oklahoma City, he will be a beast. I wouldn't be surprised if he blocks three shots a game soon. That's pretty, pretty good. good. Uh, DJ White is a horse with a oh. <laughs> shot and should bring a spark off the bench. I didn't know you're allowed to draft horses. He is a horse. He is a horse. Quite literally. Uh, that's very funny that they talked about how good he was, Westbrook was defensively, and then said that he was Gilbert Arenas without the scoring. What, what would, how are those two players a really good defensive player and then Gilbert Arenas without the scoring? How does that line up? It doesn't. It, he, it felt like he was talking about two different players. <laughs> uh, so there were some trades this summer. They traded the number 32 pick in this draft, plus Trent Plaisted. Yeah, for the pick that was DJ White. They also traded a 2009 second, number 40, so a future draft, to Charlotte for Kyle Weaver. Shout so we out. got Kyle Weaver. And then there was a three-teamer. We gave up Adrian Griffin, future coach. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, for the Thunder. Yeah. yeah. And now, like, yeah, in, in the running for, like, head coaching positions now. Wouldn't be surprised if he became one at some point. So we, we traded Adrian Griffin, Luke Ridnour in this three-team deal, got back Joe Smith and Desmond Mason, two guys who really, like, defined the vets on those early Thunder teams. Yes. Gosh, Sam was drafting, like, in, like, that 29th, like, through, like, 34th position, like, just the same dudes. Like, DJ White <laughs> is, like – the same guys that they've been drafting like the past like several years at that like, like Jay Will power. and, and yeah. Jerry yeah yes he's the same guy you know and maybe one of them will work out but like DJ White like this like very very good college power forward you know yeah it's just all the same dude it's just really really funny now we did get a free agent this summer undrafted rookie Stephen Hill played one right. game was at legend night he was he was shout out no one knew uh, who that was. I think he played one game in did. a Thunder uniform. So what is your final grade, Andrew, for the 2008 offseason? Uh, I'm giving this an A+. Plus. Yeah, I think I think uh, you got to go A+. Plus. When you get Westbrook and Serge Ibaka, Serge Ibaka is really an incredible pick, especially when you read what Jonathan Gavoni, who was very plugged in at the time, was saying that their agent, agency didn't want him drafted in the first I know. I, I remember assuming that he wasn't going to come over until I was at the Boys to Men concert and ran into Serge Ibaka and Tabo Cephalosha that yeah. summer and yeah. realized, oh man, Serge is coming over. And then, of course, we, we saw him in the uh, the summer league, and it was like, oh, this guy's way further along than people think. Yeah, and I he was playing him. his rookie season. Oh, I was working at Midwest City High School at the time, and they did the the blue and white game. Um, where they were doing, I, I don't know if they'll go back to doing it at like local high schools or not, but they had done it at all these like local high schools and you could go, it was open to the public and you could just go. Well, I was teaching there at the time. And so our principal was like, if you want to go to the game, like you, we let you in early and you can go sit, you know, front row. It's like, yeah, like that would be great. And so I went and sat before the game, I actually was walking through the halls and like getting some work done, like going to make some copies and, Sam Presti was standing in the hallway and like I went over and like had, I had to go talk to him. So I went and talked to Sam for a little bit. He was super nice. Um, it was just like such a weird moment in time to think about now. But I remember going to uh, that blue and white scrimmage and watching this game. And I remember I sent an email to Royce after the game, like breaking down like all these players <laughs> like telling him like i remember telling him that like i thought serge was like gonna be ready to play this year like he looked really good um it's Did just you get a response yeah definitely like we started like going back and forth for like a little bit um 
in emails and that's just like another moment in time that just feels so strange now where like royce is you know a friend of mine um but like royce is like one of the only like real guys covering the thunder back then too you know it's a little bit similar to to like today where there's just not that many people actually covering the thunder you know oh Um, i know yeah i read some of these articles on the athletic and uh it's like man there should be someone doing this for the thunder like obviously we have joe masato but and he does great work but it's also uh paywalled you know and i don't live in i mean joe is like our is like the lone like true beat writer you know yeah him like he's one of the only guys him and news nine are the only two that actually travel with the team you know that's it it's pretty wild um okay you want to do one more today (laughs) it's a big one i know well but i i do kind of feel like these three should be grouped together though okay 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 yeah yeah let's do it okay i got it okay so let's move on to 2009 uh i want to start with this this is from the beginning of bill simmons draft diary this is the worst draft class since the infamous Kenyon Martin draft in 2000. Yes, I remember this. If I had to bet my life on any 2000 prospect becoming a top three player on a championship team, I'd bet on Blake Griffin, Ricky Rubio, and Steph Curry. That's it. Pretty good call on Steph. People were definitely... I would say that was not the popular opinion that Steph Curry was going to be a top three player on a championship no. team. Uh, but, yeah, and you look at this draft has like pockets in it that have like Great players. I mean, you look up and down this draft, like Blake Griffin, James Harden, Derek Evans was good for a short time. Rubio, DeMar DeRozan, Curry, DeMar DeRozan, Brandon Jennings was good for a little while. Drew Holiday, Jeff Teague, Darren Ty Collison. Lawson. Ty Lawson was a good player. Danny yeah. Green, Patty Mills, Patrick Beverly. Josh like, Gibson. Yeah. Like there's good players in this draft. And it did, it did feel that way. Remember Dewan Blair too for the Spurs? He's picked 30. Yeah, no, no ACLs. No ACLs, but he was awesome for a while. Yeah, I think he made Danny all Green reasons. was picked 46 in this draft. Like there were good players in this draft. And yeah, I remember leading up to it. I remember even like the guy like Drew Holiday was being discussed. It's like, man, I don't know if you want to take him. That guy didn't do a whole lot at UCLA and was like, I remember people throwing around stats about him. Um, it's just wild to think back. Like this is actually like a, a draft that shaped the NBA. So the Thunder took James Harden at three. Byron, don't call me BJ Mullins at twenty-four. Yeah, and Robert Vaden at fifty-four. Someone who I remember being very high on at Orlando Summer League. Shooter, shooter, doesn't need Chip England. That's how good Robert Vaden is. Didn't need him ahead of his time. Uh, so. When they took James Harden, Bill Simmons wrote, the zombie Sonics take Harden. Quote, he's battled asthma since he was a child, Scott tells us. <laughs> How does Rubio drop to number four? How? I feel like I'm going to pass out. I like Harden as a glue character guy. <laughs> and he definitely has a good porn name. But considering the zombies have to worry about Durant fleeing in a couple of years, wasn't it in their best interest to find him an unselfish guard who's immensely fun to play with and who was put on earth to get Durant easy baskets. Big mistake. Wow. Uh, very funny to think of Harden as glue character guy. Yeah, he is the opposite. Uh, yeah, Bleacher Report gave them a B plus for this uh, draft. James Harden actually compliments Russell Westbrook's lack of shooting quite well. I feel like he's going to be a solid pro with decent upside. However, I still feel like they could have made it work with a Rubio and Westbrook in the backcourt together. I wonder how much influence Westbrook being adamant about playing point guard and not moving to the two had on OKC not drafting Rubio. Um, that was the narrative, right? It was like all about Ricky Rubio. And like, if you pair Ricky Rubio with this fun, young Thunder team, like what's it going to be, you know? Um, and in retrospect, like it could have been such a horrific pairing because you have a completely non-shooting backcourt, you know, in Westbrook <laughs> and Ricky Rubio. Yeah. I mean, it would have been really, really bad. So did you say that was Bleacher Report that was you just read? Yeah. Because I found another Bleacher Report grade that I just love their their description of Harden. They gave him an A+. Plus. They said, Harden is a perfect fit to play alongside Kevin Durant. He can shoot and drive into the lane. He compliments Durant perfectly. Also, he isn't someone who can lead an NBA team and be the primary creator of offense. However, as a supporting facilitator, he's the best available in this draft. 
it's this is where like draft grades really are just so silly, especially. And we, I don't, I'm sure I've done this a lot. I'm certain I have, but like we have to stop putting like ceilings on players, you know? Well, but you read that and you wonder, was that what Oklahoma City was thinking about Harden going into that draft? Because like I, yeah. all of these descriptions of Harden are a very different player from the player he would become. And I don't know if there were any, there was any indication that Harden was going to become that player. Yeah, I think they were hoped that he'd be Manu and they obviously put him in that role to begin with. Yeah. You know, that's what the hope was like. He's, he, he was, I mean, he's a lot like Manu in so many ways, except for he wanted his own team where Manu was content, you know, being on a great team. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Mullins, BJ Mullins. Yep. Mullins is athletic and could develop into that guy. Right now, he's an upgrade over Robert Swift. That's a wild swing in evaluation. He could be that guy. Also, he's an upgrade over Robert Swift. Probably both. I mean, true. One of, yeah, it's true. He he was, he, he's an upgrade. He's just a, a guy that could, you know, obey the law. You know, the uh, the the thing with B.J. Mullins, Byron Mullins, is uh, he was involved in a trade that day, Andrew. Yeah. We gave up the 25th pick plus a 2010 second, which was number 50, for the rights to take B.J. Mullins. Who was taken at number 25, Andrew? Roderick Bobois. Roderick Bobois was probably one of the first players that I had like significant regret about in the early Thunder run. We had and, in the pit of our stomach Roderick Bobois feelings. Roderick Bobois. Now, listen to this. This is from the following February, February 2010. This is Mark Cuban talking. Yeah. I'm not going to trade him. There's maybe one or two guys in the league that I would trade him for. Other than that, he's pretty much untouchable. That is a quote about Rodrigue Boubois. And if you're wondering, wow, that sounds crazy. Listen to this from Mavs Moneyball. At, this is about his rookie season. As the season wound down and Boubois continued to do well in limited action, Carlisle set him loose in the month of March. He would serve notice. He averaged over 13 points in 18 minutes per game, shooting 50, 56% from the field and 46% from three. After putting up 24 against Chicago and 22 on the Kings, Boubois simply went off against Golden State in a game that is now Mavs lore. 40 points, 9 of 11 from three, eight rebounds, and three blocks for good wow. measure. Like, wow. it wasn't just a summer league thing. Like, Rodrigue Boubois, his rookie season – it looked like we had missed big. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Like he was seen as untouchable at times. Yeah. Uh, to the Mavs. And it was just weird. I mean, I guess because it was just like late season stuff, I could call it like the Ramon Sessions test. Like, does this pass the Ramon Sessions test? Are you just Ramon Sessions where you're just good at the end of the season or are you actually good? Because like stuff happens at the end of seasons every year where guys just pop. And you just don't know. And obviously, Bobois was one of those guys. Um, another detail is that the Thunder actually had the rights to the 26 pick in the draft and traded it at the trade deadline before this draft. Um, and that pick became Taj Gibbs. And they traded uh, a first round pick for Tava Cephalosha. And that pick was the 26 pick that went to the Bulls. And they picked Taj Gibson. You can't factor that in, Andrew. That is not off season. Do not factor uh, that into your grade. Do not factor that into your grade. It's just a detail. That's a good trade, though, for both teams. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Because we could have still had Taj Gibson if, if they really wanted him at 24. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was there was one more that. trade that summer, which was Chucky Atkins and Damian Wilkins uh -huh. to Minnesota for Eton Thomas, a 2010 second rounder, number 32, and a 2010 second rounder, number 51. Now, that 2010... Number 32, this 32nd pick, we're going to talk about that next week because that was used in a trade for Daquan Cook and yep. a first-round pick. Yep. So that, that'll come, in, come into play next week when we talk about 2010. Yep. Oh, by the way, we also did get a free agent this summer, Kevin Ollie. Oh, what a great mustache. Great mustache. Wow. One of the first of – he was kind of like the first really old vet point guard <laughs> that we brought in because there was a, there was a lot of them. Yeah, there's a there's a deep history of 
of guys that were old and point guards that were on this team. And he was the first. Yep. Shout out to Kevin Ollie. Okay, so what is your final grade for the 20, 2009? Yeah, I mean, I think they got the best, the second best player in this draft. I mean, Steph Curry is the best player in this draft. I think that you could easily say that James Harden is the second best player in this draft. Um, and then considering like who else they could have had at 24, obviously, it's not great. Bob Damari Carroll would have really helped, but he was a senior. Like, would the Thunder really have taken him? I mean, probably not. Like, the other guys are kind of interesting that were taken that were good in this draft. Like, Todd Gibson was almost 24 years old at the time, a junior. Would Sam Presti actually have taken a 24 year old? Like, I just don't think so. Would he have taken Damari Carroll, who was a senior? Probably not. Dwayne Ellington went 28th, who was a junior. Would they have taken him? And then, like, you look into the second round. I mean, I just don't know. It's a lot of juniors and seniors. I think they, that was probably, I mean, that's who they wanted. He's this young, up and coming seven footer that could shoot it. It's fine. Like, it's a fine swing. He, um, he was kind of like the first Poku pick. Yeah. Where it just felt like a like the possibilities were limitless with yeah. Byron Mullins. Yeah. Like if this guy hits, that's how we were talking about him back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Without a because doubt. Because he was kind of like the idea of the unicorn before the unicorn started. Yes. Like yeah. the idea of Byron Mullins was like this guy's a seven footer who's eventually going to be able to shoot and basically do everything you would ever want a center to do. He's going to be a modern center it's going to break the game and he had huge hype coming into his college season but then didn't get a ton of time and didn't have a great freshman year at ohio state yeah um this was not off season either but this is in, involves the 2009 draft but in december and this will not factor into my trade grade don't worry in mm -hmm. december the thunder traded for eric Maynard who was the 20th pick in this draft um, and a part of this like really interesting point guard group. And when drew holiday, Ty Lawson, Jeff Teague, Eric Maynard, Darren Collison. Um, it's weird that they were all, all these point guards right in a row. And honestly, maybe Darren Collison goes before Maynard, but like, that's a pretty good ranking there too. <laughs> when they were taken. Um, um, where do you think Byron Mullins was ranked in his high school class? Coming out in 2008. Number one, baby. He was number one. Number yeah. one. Five-star yeah. recruit. Drew Holiday, number two. DeMar DeRozan, number three. Brandon Jennings, number four. Yeah, like, I remember that. That's. I mean, that was part of the reason why you want him. And, like, frankly, that's, like, part of the reason why you, like, wanted Chet, too. Is like, Chet was just a guy that performed well against his peers. I don't know how well Byron Mullins did back then. I don't know how good the eval I think the evaluations of players are like way better today than they were then. Um, but like also, what, what led to Mullins being the number one player? Like I would, I'd be very interested in that. I think it was cause he could dribble and he was seven feet tall. He's giant. Yeah. And he actually like, unlike Chet, like he weighed two sixty five. Like he was, he's a, big, a much yeah, he's a big boy. bigger guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing looking over these drafts is people talk about how much better the league is right now. You can just look at the drafts to see that. Yeah. Like so many of these drafts fall off at the end of the first round, and there's like maybe two or three guys that you're like excited about. Yeah. And I feel like in these last couple of years, like there's guys popping everywhere. Yeah, without a doubt. And there's some rough Byron, don't call me BJ Mullins photos on the internet. <laughs> Just what? Just a quick Google if you're interested. But oh, I, I remember he had he ended up having like a decent season in Charlotte. Yeah, he averaged ten and six in Charlotte one season. Played fifty three games. Yeah, he only played twenty six games for the Thunder. Now that is actually surprising because nowadays, like they would have just thrown him out there, just because oh, why yeah. not? Oh yeah, yeah. This is an interesting photo. This is not. This is actually a good photo of him. Um, but I'm going to hold on. I'm trying to share this. This is just an interesting photo that I found of Byron Mullins. Oh man, when was that? This is the 13 14 season for the Clippers. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. Um, 
It's Aaron Mullins next to Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan for the Clippers. This was their big man trio heading into that wow. season. Wow, the big there's, three. There's still hope back then for Byron. Don't call me BJ Mullins. No, that was crazy. Very talented individual. Yeah, for sure. And uh, who? So he was traded. I'm trying to figure out. Oh, he just signed as a free agent with the Clippers. Okay, that was after his like good season um, yes. with Charlotte. Yeah, but it was still only as a minimum. It appears one year minimum. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, final trade grade. You said what did you say? 2009. Um, I think I was talking myself into an A. I mean, you just have to. You draft the second best guy in the draft at three, where, I mean, it wasn't obvious that it should have been James Harden. You know, a lot of people were screaming for Ricky Rubio. Um, I think it would have been disastrous. Again, on the razor's edge of like the history of the Thunder changing significantly, you know, where would it have been better to draft Steph Curry? Yes, it would have for so many reasons. Um, but they made they made a good pick, so I'll give them an A. Yeah, I'd probably go with A as well. Um, the Mullins pick, you can't really get upset with because we it's just the, went through it. Who else the was there? Yeah, it's in the 20s. It's just like whatever. I think, you know, the, the Steph thing is interesting, except that we never really heard them link to Steph in any way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the name that they were linked to was Hashim Thabit. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the scary alt timeline, right? Yes, very scary. Because Hashim Nightmare. Thabit taken number two in this draft. There's there's some bad picks in here. Like Johnny Flynn at six is really bad. Um, although like Johnny Flynn apparently like rose up in these rankings just because he was just apparently the greatest dude ever. Uh, Fred Katz was the ball boy for that Syracuse team. And he said his first day, like Johnny Flynn took him in, like put his arm around him and showed him like the entire facility, introduced him to everybody there. And it was just like so great to him. And that's like the kind of guy mm. that Johnny Flynn was. And like Johnny Flynn rose in the draft because he was like just this awesome guy. Um, I just, I think the hearing some like Johnny Flynn, like postmortem stories is just like really interesting um to see but anyways um yeah the the beat thing though who ended up on the thunder there was obviously like genuine interest in him because he yeah. ended up on the team later but had Mem- i mean even for memphis like this is where i think a lot of like the memphis like tanking doesn't work stuff comes from it's like you take the beat too, and it's like an absolutely insanely wasted pick uh, where you could have had James Harden or Tyree, even if you just took the Memphis guy, Tyreek Evans, like how much better do you feel? Um, and then obviously like Steph Curry, everybody just overlooked Steph for so, for a lot of reasons. And some of them, obviously all of them were bad, you know, the reasons that you overlook him, but um, it's just crazy to think about. Because yeah, if the Thunder end up with the beat instead, like they're still a good team because you still have Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant, but man, it would have been different. Like I don't think you make it to the finals if you do that. Well, you, it's really hard to imagine Stephen Adams ending up on the team in that yeah. scenario. I mean, so the it would have had to be someone else. It changes the whole timeline if you take yeah. them. You know. Does, does the beat become a great player if he just goes to the right team? No, just, just if Chip England is on the team, Chip, does Hashim the beat shoot forty percent from three? Think about that. That's a great way to 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 put a bow on this. Out, what would you give it? A? You give it an A? I gave it an A as well. Yeah, yeah I think I give all these A's. Yeah, obviously, if you draft three Hall of Famers three years in a row, <laughs> going to get some good scores. A, but. Tune in next week because we're starting off with 2010, which was the Cole Aldrich draft. So uh, we the have A's some, uh, may, may be running out soon. We have some significant memories from this that I think we, we've told on this podcast before, but I can't rate, wait to recount them with uh, with you. It's going to be fun. Yes. Uh, Chip England is a part of the Thunder. It's a, it's great to to say those words and great to remember that because it's 
it's it will hopefully change the trajectory of several of these players maybe we can actually have a good shooting basketball team when this team is ready to win that'd be that would be that would be so crazy (laughs) i can't even imagine what that would be like (laughs) oh man uh thanks so much for listening to our podcast please leave us a five-star review if you've got the time it's pretty simple especially if you're on an iphone and you're listening on the little purple podcast app click on that hit the search button search down to dunk hit five stars if you leave us a little message we will read those it's very nice of you to do that you guys have a great day and we will talk to you guys again on friday